Namaste. So now we come to two very interesting verses that sit in between two bigger sections and describe how the ignorant person can approach the Supreme Self, Brahman. Svadehang Shobhanam Santang Purushakyam Chasang Matam King Murka Shunyamanatnam Dehati Tankaro Shibho Svadehang in your own body Shobhanam Blissful Santang ever existent Purushakyam, known as Purusha, Cha, and Sangmatam, established by the Shruti as identical with Brahman, King, Y, Murka, ignorant one, Shunyam, empty, non-existent, Atmanam, Atman, Dehatitam, beyond the body, Karoshi, assert, Bho, O you. O you ignorant one, why do you assert the blissful ever-existent Atman, which resides in your own body and is obviously different from it, which is known as Purusha and is established by the Shruti as identical with Brahman, to be absolutely non-existent. Svatmanam shrunumukha tvang shrutya yuktya cha purusham dehati tang sadakaram sudurdarsham bhavadrisham Svatmanam your own self Shrinu Murka, O ignorant one, Tvang, you, Shrutya, by the Shruti, Yuktya, by reasoning, Cha, also, Purushang, Purusha, Dehati Tang, beyond the body, Sadakaram, the very form of existence, Sudurdarshang, very difficult to be seen, Bhavadrasham, by persons like you. O oh, you ignorant one, try to know, with the help of Shruti and reasoning, your own self, Purusha, which is different from the body, not a void, but the very form of existence, and very difficult for persons like you to realize. So he's really calling out the materialists and the mental speculators and the religionists and the fruitive workers and the atheists and all the other nonsense people. Because Brahman is not an object of action. In other words, we throw around the phrase realize Brahman, or meditate on Brahman, or even see Brahman. Uh, for example, in this first shloka, how can you assert that this Brahman doesn't exist? See, it goes both ways. You can't assert that Brahman exists because Brahman is never the object of an action or even of consciousness. It can be an object of knowledge indirectly. In other words, we can have knowledge about Brahman, but we can never have knowledge of Brahman. I'll explain why a little bit later. 
And similarly, we can't deny that Brahman exists because Brahman is the self, Atman, and is the self of even the person who is denying its existence. So you see, this leads to a logical conundrum that although the self cannot be known, we can know or realize the self by being the self. Just like Ramana says, the self is already realized in all beings. In other words, we're all already enlightened. So why don't we feel like we're enlightened? Why are we still suffering? Why are we still subject to karma? Uh, because we have the wrong idea. Number one, that the self is the body. And number two, that the self can be the object of any action. So we've been discussing the fact that the self is not the body. That should be clear by now. Although he's going to return to it in the next section. <laughs> just to drive it home. Huh? But the more subtle point, which is very difficult to grasp, is that the self can never be the object of any action, including knowledge. Ordinary knowledge is really a, a business of name and form. Bring me my glasses, right? I can say that because my glasses have a name. And even the, the uh, Shruti, the Upanishads, say, you must realize Brahman. Brahman is to be known. Brahman is to be meditated on. Brahman is to be seen and so forth. So what does it mean when a scripture like this says you must see Brahman? If Brahman can't be seen, huh? there's a lovely passage in the Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad that says, how can we see the one through whom everything is seen? How can we know that one by which everything is known? See, this is where it becomes a logical conundrum. How can you know the knower? How can you see the seer? You can't. But the knowledge can be like a goad. It can be like a motivation. It can be like, oh, you don't know Brahman? You know, what's wrong with you? Because you are Brahman. How can you not know Brahman? Of course you know Brahman. You just don't know you know it. <laughs> so the knowledge acts to direct our attention away from the ordinary things of the world and towards the self. That's all that's necessary. Just like in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, yoga is defined as... Uh, Chitta vritti nirodha. Chitta means consciousness. Vritti means transformation into name and form. And nirodha, of course, means to uh, get rid of, to eliminate. So chitta vritti nirodha means to stop the consciousness from taking forms. Consciousness is like a mirror. It reflects whatever you put in front of it. A mirror in and of itself has no qualities except reflection. So if you put something red in front of it, it turns red. If you put something square in front of it, it becomes square and so on. So consciousness is like that. Whatever you put before consciousness, it assumes that shape and quality and even the name. 
So therefore we have language and we can talk about things. But notice that our language always has a subject, a verb, and an object. So you see, language is based around the idea of perception and manipulation of things. And the subject, which always goes unsaid, is I. Oh yes, you can say the word I. But you can never see I. That's why, because misled by language, we identify the body as I. Then the language makes sense. I saw the light. <laughs> no, the body perceived the light. And I saw the body. I saw the perception. See, there's no action involved in consciousness. And similarly, there's no action involved in meditation. The only action involved in meditation is through knowledge, and not knowledge of the sort that requires a predicate, a verb, and an object. Because if the object of uh, scriptural knowledge is to realize Brahman, Brahman can never be the object of any action. So even an action so subtle as knowledge cannot really grasp Brahman. It cannot make an object of Brahman. It cannot make an object of the self. Why? Because the self is always subjective. It's always I. It's always the seer. It's never the seen. It's the knower, never the known. It's the thing that precipitates the existence of things. It is not the thing that exists. Try to understand. It's like a catalyst. In a chemical reaction, a catalyst is a substance that makes the reaction happen or facilitates the reaction, but is not involved itself directly in the transformation that takes place. So the self is sort of like a catalyst. Its mere presence makes all kinds of things happen, like the material manifestation, <laughs> consciousness, knowledge, and so on. So the self is the origin of everything, the cause of everything, but it is never a thing. It is never caused. It is never originated by anything else. This is the meaning of the absolute. Brahman is absolute. The self is absolute. And Brahma Vichara or Atma Vichara means to inquire into this. Just like Brahma Sutras, Vedanta Sutras open with Atato Brahma Jignasa and Jignasa is almost a synonym for Vichara. Jignasa actually means the desire to know. So let us desire to know Brahman. So that's good, except we can't really directly know Brahman, where we can know about Brahman from the scriptures. To actually become or experience oneself as Brahman, one needs to practice Atma Vichara. And that is the subject of this work. Aum Tatsa. Aum Shakti Aum.